If you want to be a crusher at poker, you gotta surround yourself with competent people who are well-intentioned and want the best for you. That's what all the crushers did when they're on their way up to success. That's why I've created the best goddamn poker community the world has ever seen, and it's free. Check out my Discord in the link below. We're doing some magnificent things there, and I want to help you, yeah, you, there to be the best version of you that you can possibly be. So you can go out there and get stacking, as my old friend uh, Evan Jarvis says. Welcome, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, everything in between. We don't know who's hosting this, so I'm going to intro, and then you can intro as well. Okay. All right. Welcome, everyone. Yo, yo, yo. Welcome to the podcast, which may be on my channel, maybe on Charlie's channel. Uh, I'm sure you all know Charlie by now. And if you're on my channel, I'm sure you know me. Perfect. All right, dudes, what do you want to talk about? We've got so many things, life and poker and fucking anything. Yeah. I feel I feel like I followed your journey quite quite closely, even even from afar. And that sounds a bit weird, but it's true. Uh, ever since you won the uh, the high roller, the twenty five k, I think that was the first sort of breakout tournament for you. And obviously, I've I've watched your journey then sort of go beyond poker. And I'm kind of getting to that point now with my career. So I I was very very fortunate over the last end of last year, going to like a sick private game, won multiple seven figures, and now I'm at the point where it's like, what the fuck do you do now? <laughs> Oh, and I'm fucking, sure that you, wait, wait, you won millions. Yeah, yeah, like three million in in the course of like three months. Dude, congrats. Yeah, it was pretty that's crazy. Nice. Obviously, I, I, like shit. pieces and staking and all that kind of stuff, yeah, but yeah, still, yeah. like, still, holy shit. But yeah, it was crazy. That's that's kind of why I disappeared off the face of the planet, social media wise, for a while. What were you playing? And it was just like, but honestly, this is what I want to talk to you about a little wait, bit. Wait, wait, wait. Like, what, what, what stakes were you playing? I got to hear more about this. Two hundred, four hundred. Uh, hold him. Yeah. He won three million. Yeah, I, I, uh, it, well, without trying to sound too ar arrogant or too, what's, I don't know what the word is. I'm going to give it its due. It was like all the poke lessons, all the life lessons, all the, the tilt lessons, all the, everything kind of just came together for this like moment. And I was like, this is like my, my, my dream spot. Like wow. it was the right level of player in terms of the professionals that were there. It was the right level of player in terms of the amateurs that were there. I knew exactly what was going on. I knew exactly what to say in certain situations, exactly how to feel, exactly how to pick myself up after a losing session. Like there were some pros there that, uh, I mean, basically every pro won, but there were some pros there that were like break even or win like 50K. So even to win 3 million, it wasn't like everyone else. I was, I was clearly the biggest winner by far. And I was just there like sick. Like I just focus on the spot. This is going to change my life. But then sort of like, it's all done now, and I'm now in Thailand, and I'm like, "What the fuck do you do now?" Oh, yeah, like, you got three, three million dollars in Thailand. What are you going to do? Buy the fucking country? <laughs> well, I bought, I bought, a, I bought a little bit of it. I have some land here now, but it's, it's, it's less about that. It's more about like, I, I, I guess the last sort of like ten years of my life, my whole purpose has been like make money at poker, make a living outside the UK, and I was like, well, I'm not really that motivated to play poker anymore. So what the hell am I going to do? And that's kind of what I want to talk to you about because obviously you must have gone through something similar like that. There must have been a point in your career where you're like well, the money doesn't really matter anymore. Or you've got that confidence where it's like, you know, if I did lose all this money, I can still go back to whatever stakes I want to play. I can still go staking. I can still do what I want to do. Um, but what do I want to do? Like poker has been a job for so long that it's it's uh, it's like, oh, what do you do now? Yeah, for, for me, it was it was maybe like five years ago. And I was, I was deep in meditation on, 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 this is back in my psychedelic days. I don't do them anymore. And in fact, I recommend people not to do them. But I was deep in meditation about, about my life. And I started getting all of this imagery. I'm not a very visual person in general, but psychedelics, they can help these things. And I started getting all, these, all this imagery of these, these projects that I could create in my future if I decided to walk this path. And it was to be in service to the world. It was to try and do as much good in the world as I possibly could. And I felt so deeply within my fucking balls that it was, it was real. And I realized that if I wanted to go gun ho with poker, I couldn't go down this path. Like it had to be one or the other because poker is just so all encompassing. Even yep. if you just want to play once a week, you have, like, if you're playing the high stakes, like I was and, and, and you have as well, you have to be on top of it. You have, you have to, you have to understand the soul of the game and how it's evolving. Yep. And I, I made a decision to just step away from poker. I, and like you said, I knew that I could go back, I could coach, I could play, I could do whatever and make loads of money. And I did come back in fucking big seven figures, jump back out again every now and again. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it's, it, was, it, it was tough. It was, and as I'm sure a lot of poker players can recognize, walking away from the constant barrage of dopamergic and serotogenic fucking rushes to the brain 
and the validation that you get if you're on a YouTube channel or if you're winning a tournament or a cash game and the, the people that come up to you and congratulate you. All of that external validation that we probably didn't get as kids just fucking just going into us to step away from that, it leaves this void. And for me, it was tough. It was really, really tough to, to not try and run back to poker and keep playing and keep grinding and, you know, watching all these other people running around the world, winning shit ton of money and people being like, oh, they're the goat, they're the goat. And being like, it could have been me, you know, it, the, the, the mindset is it's, it's tough one to overcome. But personally, when I take a step back from poker, and I see people that have been in it for maybe 20 years, you know, they've, they've grinded their bankroll from, you know, a million to two million to three, three, four, five, six, seven, whatever, they're, they're, they're crushing it, but they haven't explored life. And yeah. at some point you've got to explore life. Like poker can't be the end. It has to be a means to an end. And so, so for me, it was what's going to bring me the most joy in the world. And the answer is to aim every atom of my body towards this northern star point to say i'm going to try and do as much good in the world as possible and i'm going to see how far i can get and yeah. to start that it was i have to do as much work on myself as possible to make sure that when i'm in a position of responsibility i'm not going to punt uh, so yeah. the last last five years of my life have been a lot of self-work but also learning how to play the game of capitalism and then also how to play the game of fucking charity world which is half capitalism half people are actually on a team and it's a fucking weird mix uh yeah so that that's that's where i'm at i'm i've got like fucking a lot that's just ready to launch as soon as i press the go button and i'm just making sure that i'm in the right place to when everything launches be the fucking guy that isn't going to turn up late to meetings or isn't going to pun a decision or whatever it is yeah no that's that's really great man that's a lot of what you just said really resonates with where i'm at now i know that might alienate some of the up and coming poker players like oh these guys they've made what are a poker and they're just pondering about life and stuff like that but Ooh, it is... what are you gonna do with your millions <laughs> oh no it's terrible <laughs> oh no this guy's bar to go to tonight <laughs> but it's, it's interesting because like when you have like you just said like when you had that all-encompassing thing which was poker and then as again like youtube as well um like one of the biggest things for me like not sharing on social media which i'd like built this habit of and i was getting this like dopamine rush like every time i could share something positive and say something fun and you convince yourself that you're doing that for like other people as well but at the same time you're like oh deep down no i'm, I'm enjoying this i'm i'm liking this audience I had a really really good conversation with uh jay nandez and he's a I great love, guy I love jay yeah, nandez. yeah and uh i spoke to him in vegas and it was around when i was running my academy and I was a bit like, well, this academy is going well and I'm coaching all these guys and I'm, I'm happy. But one of the biggest things for me in poker was it was about freedom and it was about like doing what I want when I want to do it. And this is kind of I've almost give myself a job without meaning to. And I had a really great conversation with him about it. He goes, well, you've got to look at it from the point of view that your business or whatever it is, is you're building this castle. And at the end of the day, if you, you can't have it in your mind that you're going to build this castle so big and then you're going to walk away from this castle because then there was no point building that castle in the first place. So if you're not enjoying the coaching, you're not enjoying doing this thing, then don't do it. Like find your reason to do it, make it around that. Don't worry about the money as much because yeah, it's like easy to build an academy, not easy, but like, you know, you can build an academy, sell a few courses for a thousand dollars and all of a sudden, you, you know what I mean? You could, you know, spin out some YouTube videos, post some of your graphs and your winnings, talk about this $3 million challenge and everything else. And I'm sure that you could sell coaching and help people and do that kind of stuff. But if you don't actually want to do that, then then don't do it. So then I had to really think about like, why do I actually enjoy making content because that was always a big thing for me when i first started i was like why am i doing this i'm just kind of clicking buttons on the screen people are resonating with it but i don't know why i'm doing it so forcing myself to do it a little bit but i the deep root of that for me was i really enjoyed the human experience of it like the people that i somewhat helped or like going to events which used to be i used to never really go to too many events in the uk because i was more of an online player i was a bit like outside the live poker scene so it was more of a like but now i go to events and people come and say hi to me i love that it's like i feel a bit awkward sometimes but at the same time it's like i really enjoy that that i get to do that there are people that i've uh there's a few a lot of the people that i resonate with recently actually have been uh former addicts that are going through like the uh the 12 step program because like you said about working on yourself a lot of the things that they have to do is working on themselves so a lot of the people that are sort of around me right now are former addicts and i love helping those people like i love like seeing that side of them because i see that in myself but I, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily been addicted to drugs uh probably had a mild sex addiction at some point in my life but 
at the same time, like it's all it, it, it's all the same thing. It's all like working on yourself, and they they've just got the more deliberate steps to do it, and they're really helping me think about my thing as well. You know what? Yeah, there is a lot of dopamine here, and there is things that I do like. What am I actually doing because I'm on autopilot? And what am I doing because I actually want to do it? And what do I actually want to do? And I'm still kind of like, I'm enjoying it. But at the same time, it's like, I feel deep down, I need, I need the sense for purpose of like, what do I do next? So for me, I'm filling that up again. And I realize I'm doing this now with these like, uh, I'm going to going to go to WPT. I'm going to film some vlogs. I'm going to see how if I enjoy that. And that's something that I enjoy doing because, but that's not me stepping away from poker. Maybe I'm too scared to do that. Maybe I'm just doing that because that's another form of poker. Because the other thing about poker as well, yeah, with deep, uh, for me, it was cash games. Tournaments for me is still like a hobby or still fun. I'm not, I'm not a professional tournament player. Like I, I get to deep ICM and go, I don't know what I'm doing. So this is fun. I can work this out. I can activate my brain again. And uh, similar to when Holden players moved to Omaha, they're like, yeah, it's poker, but like, I haven't got a clue. Um, it's still fun, still uses those muscles and still allows you to like explore more. But may maybe I'm just not, I'm, I'm nearly there, but not quite there yet, if that makes sense. Outside of poker, what, what makes your heart sing? I don't know, because poker's just been such a big part of it. My whole family plays poker. Like my mom plays poker. Like I, I, one of the biggest things I used to spend money on when I, when I won a bit of money, one of the biggest things that's part of me that all my coaches recognize is like, I love taking care of my family. So it's a big part of me. So like one, like first time I had some money in the bank, first thing I did was fly mom and dad to Aussie millions, pay for their buy-ins and be like, right, good luck. And that was so <laughs> fun to like, to do that. My dad, my dad came second in the PLO. Like, I didn't have a piece of anything. It was like, great, sick. Um, I'm happy for you guys. And uh, and then over the years, I've been like, okay, how can I help my parents retire? How can I support them the way that they, they, you know, they love me and support me? And part of me was like, I want to move to Thailand. It's a better life here. It's like cheaper. They can retire earlier. Like, but then it's like, but even they need a purpose because if I just bring them over here to sit on a beach all day, they're going to be bored, stupid after like a week. Like buying them a bar or buying them like, a, I think I was going to, I was thinking about buying my mom a dog sanctuary because that would just be something that she'd love to do. But then it's like, even then, like, then I felt like I was forcing my choices onto them a little bit. So then I was like, well, if I just give them cash, maybe they'll figure it out themselves because I don't want to force them into doing something. Because they, they came over to Thailand actually when I was stuck in this private game, so I couldn't meet them. And it, they went from loving Thailand to, ah, it's a bit bored without you. And I was like, oh yeah, I guess the only reason they come here is because I'm here. So I'm kind of forcing them to do that. But I don't know, other than that, I don't know, poker is just such a big part of it from in all different facets. I don't know. When you were younger, did you ever enjoy like music or art or writing? Okay, or okay. So actually, you just hit me with something actually that I forgot about. Is like, I actually do like, I do consider myself. I don't consider myself a poker player anymore. My coach said this to me. I'm now a storyteller, which actually is a theme of poker too, because we are always telling stories. We're trying to work out if the story is correct. I actually think that's a big theme of my poker journey. I actually used to do stand up comedy, which is again telling Dude, stories. I'm so ready to get into stand up comedy. <laughs> I'm so I, I'm not I'm obviously not going to grind it, but I I'm uh, I was talking to Jungle about having a fucking stand up off. I'm so down. I'll tag me in all if you if you're going to do some like big thing in Vegas, I'll I'll happily I'll jump up. I've got I've got poker related jokes as well that I could only tell to a poker audience, but uh, um, let's figure but it, like, let's fi let's figure it out. Let's have some kind of prop bet and see who can do better on their first time on stage. It's hard to judge that though. But yeah, no, no, no. Um, we can get the audience to judge it if we, if we. we uh, I think, the, I think a better way to judge it might be to, uh, to get like professional comedians to just like top, and then they, they're like the panelists. I like that. Yeah, yeah, I like yeah. that too. Yeah, yeah because they judge the, the audience is a little bit of a popularity contest, but the the uh, the the yeah, professionals yeah, are going to be a bit yeah, more yeah, like, like, yeah, you, but obviously factor in the audience too, obviously when they when they judge. But that have I mean, you ever, have you ever tried it? I've won awards for a stand-up comedy. I used oh, to... Uh... Okay. This sounds like a pun of my... I, get, I need odds. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's been a long, long time. Oh, yeah. Been... Right, uh, I've won awards. Yeah, but, uh, but I mean, no, no, no. I don't want to give odds. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, it's been, I'm, it's I'm, been I'm... months since I've been on stage. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my award here. Um, no, I was, I, was an overweight, I was an overweight chubby ginger kid. Of course, I had to be fine. Oh, yeah, what what was so I going to do? Funny. you got to be so funny. <laughs> You're, you can't run away. So. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm screwed. I'm like, oh, I'll make you laugh. Leave me alone. Yeah. Um, please like me, please notice me. Um, but yeah, it's, well, I had, a, but I also, I also really enjoy writing. So I think that, uh, I was actually going to look into like script writing and just like looking into that kind of stuff really, because the advantage you have now, when you have a level of wealth is you can, you can skip some of the early grind steps. Yeah. So for example, if I start writing and I just, I'm not just like hoping that someone knows I can literally pay a professional to be like, Hey, is this any good? What do I do need to do to improve? And do you know anyone that would be interested in reading this or publishing this or whatever it is? And that's the big advantage we have now at this level, I think. But again, that's still quite hedonistic. I, I want to give, give maybe some advice there. Okay. Have these things as hobbies. Don't have them okay. as purpose. Like okay. you're, you're in a position now. You've got a great brain. Well done. You've trained it in poker. 
you've got a shit ton of money well done for three million bing that's crazy that's literally insane uh and you're in a position where you have a shit ton of free time you can solve issues in the world it doesn't have to be a huge one it doesn't have to be that i'm gonna solve poverty it could be like oh i really care deeply about old age pensioners in coventry or in uk or whatever it's going to be i really care about the prison system find a problem that you want to solve and solve it i guarantee you that will find you purpose and it will give you meaning and you can even make money whilst you do it you can even create a business that solves the problem instead of just a charity or you could you know you could create a non-profit you could do anything you want but i i guarantee that like from the brief time that i've known you you love to solve problems you love the journey you love the adventure and then you could tell those stories as you go yeah, and I think that's a big part of sales too. It's just selling, is uh, telling stories, and a, and a good story is going to be validated with solving an actual issue. Yeah, is there anything that you deeply care about in the world? I think that education it should be completely revamped. To be honest, I feel oh, like yeah, uh, me too. By the way, <laughs> yeah, I feel like the the way the system works now is just completely bonkers. I think that a quick fix for me would be to change the way student loans work, even in the UK, because I feel like they give away too much i think we just uh, glorify university education when it doesn't need to be i feel like any 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 course that can prove that it leads to a job at the end uh, with whatever criteria should qualify for some sort of sort of, sort of finance yeah. like even I, I, I think hairdresser i think in the future and as as somebody who employs people i never look at where they went to university or what they did for yeah. university I just, I just couldn't care less I, I look at the experience and what they've done and you know, if they if they have an education that that's a, a bit more vocational, if they have something that that's a bit more hands on, I would much prefer that. Like, you know, you've hired editors. You don't give yeah. a fuck where they went to university. You care how no, you just look at what they've done or like yeah, exactly. and then and then you kind of just measure them on how punctual and how good they are and and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so so perhaps perhaps a solution to that would be to take student loans and then apply them to cheaper online universities that are actually. I, I think that's a that's a really quick government fix. I think that the future for the private side is so one of the companies I used to work for, they they wanted you to they they employed out of university more out of the fact that they thought that was just a quick filter. But then after that, they did gave you a lot of tests and a lot of um like a very, very hard process to get into this company. They basically cared more about you passing their process than you having the degree. But I think that like one of the big things Tesla always says is like their, their bottleneck right now is, is people. They don't have enough engineers. So imagine rather than um, rather than university being a thing, imagine if Tesla, Amazon, and all these big companies came together, built a system where they were like, we are happy to give anyone that passes this system a job at the end of this. And they signed it off so that it was completely approved by their test. Like this person, if he can do X, Y, and Z, and he has these competencies, and we're happy with the way that you give them these competencies, at the end, we are very happy to give this person a job. That seems like a no-brainer. Fuck yeah. So do that. Yeah. I, 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 I've had that in the back of my head. You just kind of brought it to the forward. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, for, for me, it's like... You know, when I, when, I, when I walk outside and I see homelessness and my brain comes up with a solution, I'm like, wait. And you have, this thing, you, have, you have this thing when you're a kid, you're like, adults are smart. They'll just do stuff that makes sense. And then you grow up and you look around and it's like, oh, everyone's really still retarded. Uh, like really, yeah. really retarded. Like you next level just, retarded. I'm, I'm helping a few poker players out and they go and they, they still do the classic thing of why doesn't he do this? And why does he not realize that's a bad thing to do? And I have to just remind them, they're like, you're not playing with smart people. That's yeah. like tight. And then, and then you realize that that just, that just, factors out to the world that applies to like politics and geopolitical yeah. matters and diplomacy and wars and stuff it's just a yeah. bunch of people's egos getting inflamed and yeah the same the same thing like if you're looking at tackling homelessness you'd think that all the people in charge are doing the right things but they're not they're just like taking billions of dollars of government uh loans or whatever it is government funding and just punting it into bureaucracy because they that's how they've been told how to do it and so i i think we're in a generation where the the technological nerds of of the world and that that's us included have an, a good opportunity where we've made money through poker or crypto whatever it is to be like actually no you guys are doing it wrong i'm going to prove that you can do it better by starting this company and i'm going to do what you've been doing but way better and then we're going to scale and that that for me is that that's the adventure man that's 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 where poker was it was poker step one you know poker's like oh okay my brain works pretty good uh, you know, you proved it to know. yourself. You you're competent in a, in a, in another field. If anything, one of the hardest fields, in my opinion. Yeah, no, it's I, I mean it's fucking tough. Like it, 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 I never found it tough just because I loved it. 
and it's the same now if i if i'm working on something that i know that i love then it's it's not tough at all but when i when i find myself doing things i i don't enjoy like the amount of fucking zoom meetings i've been on in the last few years of fucking lawyers and stuff like that it's it's tough like that for me is way tougher than fucking winning at poker. Yeah, how do you- yeah, I was looking recently and uh, my friend was telling me about the uh, etymology of words. And he said that passion comes from uh, back in the day, it meant something that you're willing to suffer for. So that's that's pretty interesting that for poker, we're both clearly passionate about it because we were willing to put in those hours and and suffer for it because we yeah. actually cared about it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I don't know if I'd call it suffering to be honest. I mean, I, my body was that's suffering. That's what it is. That's, that's the point. I was waking right? up every day with a smile on my face, chugging those monster energy drinks and doing whatever the fuck I was yeah, doing. Right. We're doing over 14 hours of 100 Zooms a day. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. And it was the best that day chest. Ever. Yeah. Do you remember those fir- first days where you started winning like three figures a day? Or like- yeah, and you, and you do the calculation on the back of your... Uh, of like, oh, if I did this every day for a year, how much money I would have? And if I could... Oh, I could afford to do this and I could afford yeah. to do that. And then you lose the next day. Oh, we don't we don't talk about that. <laughs> you know, I, I had a day when I, when I, when I was moving to... Uh, I, was mo- I moved to Jersey and grinded for, for a year before before I, I decided I was going to be a poker player. And I was playing two and 400 an hour and I was going up and down between them. It was still really... I was less than a year into my career. And I was making a thousand dollars a day and I did it every day for maybe like four weeks. And it was, it was crazy stuff. Then fucking punt it all the way at five ten, and so, you know, I had to grind back, grind back up. But it was like, as a kid that grew up where, you know, you find a five pound note and you're like, this is a fucking good day. I'm going to fucking invest this, <laughs> you know, whatever. Uh, I grew up super poor and that level of money, yeah. it's just, you did, you did too. Yeah. Mom, where, where did you grow up? Uh, Birmingham. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, one time we had to cancel Christmas. My mom was like, sorry, I can't afford it this year. <laughs> Holy shit. Man, yeah. that, that's probably a deeply upsetting... Uh, it's not even that bad a thing, but when your mom's really upset and... Yeah, it's it's, it's, and... it's, it's pretty brutal. My, my dad was also a gambling addict, which is interesting because I ended up being a poker player. So, so it's like, well, that's why in my family we see the big line between gambling and poker. How, how did he how did they react to you getting into poker when when you have that well, they didn't really have much of a choice when they my, my mom basically paid for my baby stuff by playing poker they were basically what you professionals back in the day and then as my mom slowly grew up the ranks and then ended up with her own business running a uh, children's day nursery uh there were some months apparently where if she didn't make a tournament uh, there, no one was getting paid and yeah so the, the extra, explain that to the tax man one year was pretty funny <laughs> That's have you how have you declared a loss for the last three years? Well, huh, I won a few tournaments and I <laughs> <laughs> what? Man, that's insane. So they weren't worried at all because your dad's gambling addiction. Well, it's interesting because the way my kind of journey went, my mom and dad were always pretty supportive, and it was always great that I could kind of go all in because even though I didn't, I almost held myself back because I did try the whole real job thing. And I went, I started off with like um I worked in McDonald's for a little bit. Then I moved into like recruitment, which is people don't know is basically just sales. And then I ended up working as a consultant on, on a pretty a pretty high end consultant on like aircraft carriers and submarines and stuff. And even after all that, after I tried all that, I was like, nah, poker's still better. I was like, I'm I'm doing this job where I have to fly up to Scotland every week, and and then I come back at the weekend, and, and I'm thinking, yes, I'm finally gonna have enough money. I get to play all these GKPTs and GPS tournaments. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna have so much fun at the weekends, and then I get home at the weekend. Oh, I do not want to move out of this room because I'm knackered from this job, yeah. picking up eighteen hundred pounds a month, which I'm sure, which is a great salary, obviously. But it's like, well, there's my rent, there's my bills, there's this, there's that. I'd rather have two thousand dollars a month in Thailand than have this. So it was a no brainer at a certain stage. Yeah, that's but wild. they were like, well, I guess you, if you lose, you can just come back home and get a job. Yeah, and I, I, I let, let's speak a little bit responsibly. And it's like <laughs> most people, most people out there that want to be professional poker players are not going to make it. Yeah. Uh, and you know, maybe maybe having a backup plan if you're not super talented is is okay. But I, well, well, something here's something I've noticed is that poker is such a good stepping stone to becoming something else. So. There are loads of poker editors that, as you know, are fucking rare to come. It's rare to come across a good editor that also really knows poker. Like that, yeah. that, that crossover is, is fucking. It's hard to find, and when you find a good one, it's like fucking gold dust. It's like you struck yeah. you gold. Uh, and then there's like poker nutritionists. There's like the Elliot Rowe who does like poker hypnosis or whatever. 
uh that there's uh that there's there's just so many so many different versions of poker stuff like poker marketer you know stuff, stuff like that poker developer yeah. uh there's so so many different versions of what you can be if you get into poker but i, I think it's worth a lot of people speaking about that because a lot of people see it as either you're a poker player or you get a job um mm. but i i i've met marketers that are making fucking six figures just from helping poker players you know and if that's, you get really good marketing, fuck yeah yeah, it's it, well. There's so much money in our industry compared to like gaming, for example. Like gaming, you think would have all that, but there's no, there's not. There is money in that industry, but not compared to poker. We're paying for like thousands and millions, and the prize pools are just absolutely enormous. Whereas yeah. Obviously, in a gaming respect, you're talking to like teenagers that are just like, oh, we might buy the game. <laughs> and and as well, like the the gaming industry, like League of Legends, is a lot more like a tournament where the top yep. top twenty places pay huge, and then everyone else just fucking min cashes or whatever. Whereas yeah. poker, you could be the four thousandth best player in the world. You're still making probably six figures a year, or, or maybe like yeah. five figures. I don't know, but a decent uh, amount at least. Yeah, I have no idea how much poker. I don't know. It's weird because like so, some poker players I know are just like struggling along, and some players I know are just like you know. It, it feels like there's a there's a level for some players where they just hit a level of wealth and they just kind of coast. So it's like you know, once you got like a six figures in your bank and you know that you can make five to 10k a month you're like yeah i'll play sometimes and i'll play video yeah. games and i'll go, go you know i'll do just i'll chill over here for a bit and i'll chill over there for a bit i met a lot of those people that did that back in the day uh when poker was like ridiculously easy before i started playing and then they realized that you know and ben and i used to have this thing that when we we're labeling people shark scopes to see how good people were we had a label that said pgt which is poker's got tough and their shark scope would be like duh, 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 and then it'd be a break in there like, <laughs> yeah and uh so I, yeah maybe maybe if uh if anyone's listening to that that uh take take heed the advice and don't don't fucking it. imagine the games are going to be as soft as they are right now well do you think poker is as hard as it's ever going to be or do you think poker is going to continue to get harder honestly i feel like poker is hot easier now than it was like three years ago that's interesting yeah I, I i know that playing like 200 zoom is harder um but there's just so many other sites and so many yeah. other places live that you can crush right now i feel like the boom is really coming back and yeah. as well i i'm sure we agree on this to at least some extent so much misapplication of gto that there are very few comical absolute crushes in the world in so you know back back in the day when playing 500 zoom there'd be like pre gto times there'd be like some people that just got the game so intuitively well they'd be crushing the pool for like 12 bb per hundred you know and and these people don't really exist too much anymore because they've all gone up to this ridiculously high stakes they they understand gto plus the the exploitative side and now you're left playing against people that at best are going to be like grinding away like a six bb per hundred but usually it's like one or two because yeah. they're they're taking these game theory concepts and completely misapplying them in every single context that they come across because they heard some commentator say that you need to be fucking unblocking the flush draws or whatever, whatever. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I really feel like that there's a big vacuum at the moment for absolute annihilators. There's a there's a couple of stories that, that links that I think people would be interested in. There's a guy called Marco Pierre White, and he is a three-time Michelin star chef. He's like the first one or the youngest one. I can't remember which one. And he, he he retired from from cooking after after that. And people were like, "Why did you do that?" He goes, "I just realized I was being judged by people that didn't know as much about food as I did. So this whole like chase for these Michelin stars just began to just not mean anything." And I feel that like this guy's probably taking some LSD to be honest, but <laughs> just the way he talks. But um, it's interesting because the biggest problem in our industry, especially in the education side, is that people are way too scared to say something that might be seen as wrong because I had people and I won't name names that came to my apply to my academy and and he was playing 500 zoom and I was like well that's a pretty high level why would you want to necessarily join my academy my academy is more like yeah 500 zoom can join but like uh, maybe maybe you're teaching me things now and um and he said I said well I like that you can play and he goes I made, he made videos for running once and he goes the things that you do, I don't do on my videos because I feel like I want to fold, but because I'm making a video, I don't fold. And I'm like, that's literally what's wrong with this industry. Yeah, I was like, that's, that's literally that's it. it. Because you're worried that five people are going to tell you off because, oh, that's not DTO. You folded there. You're going to get exploited when you know you're not getting exploited. And you can't even, you can't put that on a video and put it on an education site because you're more worried about being wrong and being like showing up than actually playing how you play, which is clearly winning. And it's yeah. just like that, that right there was like, that's literally what's happening. Like, 
like you you see all this education content like let's let's take let's say i started coaching for say upswing let's hypothetically say that there's there's a big chance that if i start posting about how i play and that i'm going to get like a, a thousand people go oh that's stupid jim only bets one third on these flops clearly this is the right thing to do oh he's overbetting in these spots and he keeps overfolding in these spots and this is ridiculous all of a sudden i'd lose my job as a, as a coach at upswing and they'd be like oh sorry jim like everyone keeps complaining about all this stuff and it's like well you know without i'm not going to drop it here but i'm gonna drop the hammer while i can just won three million dollars mate and i play like that so it's like <laughs> so like and i've been making them living at this game for a long long time maybe 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 the 25 an hour guy that has moved up doesn't know what he's talking about yeah and I, but, I, and to be to be fair to the other people like if you and i wanted to be the best player in the world we'd have to study the sims and we'd have to speak to people that have studied the sims we'd we, you know if we wanted to be playing at the highest level online cash you know if we want to be playing against linus that that's you know we'd, we'd take our knowledge but we'd also have to apply it to the, like, the deep, deep, deep understanding of game theory, which I, I assume you also haven't done the fucking years of grinding the Sims like like these. Yeah, people. yeah. Um, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm not going to. It's funny when you start to understand poker at such a deep level, which I like to feel like I do. It's funny how close you get to the Sim result anyway. Yeah, the, you know, the most annoying thing that I keep that I keep coming across is that I'll I'll, I'll make a play be like, fuck GTO, just so you know, for memes. And then you're, and and then you're like, oh, there'll be someone in the comment being like, actually, I put this through the sim and this yeah. is actually a low frequency play. And I'm like, I, 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 that's not the point. Like so, yeah. sometimes like the, the difference is like my thought process to get to this answer is completely different. to it's, it. and, and your thought process is way more important than what the sim says. Because I always compare the Sims to like a calculator. It's like, all right, you're at school, you learn your times table. Everyone knows 12 times 12 is 144 because you memorized it. But if I say to you, what's 32 times 32, you need to be able to work that out and say it's 1024 without going, oh, uh, I haven't got, I haven't memorized that chart. You know what I mean? I, you have to actually go, well, however you do it. For me, it's like 32, put a zero on the end, times it by three, and add, add it on yeah, twice. Yeah, yeah. Whatever. That's how I, 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 I've learned how to do it, not I've learned what the number answer is. Because you can't learn every answer. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it, it's something I, I love watching students figure out for themselves. So, you know, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll give them a little bit of a point in the right direction. And I, I always say the same thing that if you want to get good at poker, you have to do this. You have to go, what is my opponent's range? And what am I going to do about it? And all of the other stuff like, oh, and I had someone on my Discord fucking this morning being like, uh, Charlie, how do I approach this? It's a 2NL player. It's like, how do I approach this? The, this, the content I've been watching saying that I... I don't want to be betting a third because then I'll end up with a merged range on the river against and I was like, you're playing two and L, dude. <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you've got a set, bet two X pot. If you've got a bluff. Yeah, bet big if you it. have a good that's hand. If the it. guy doesn't fall, don't bluff. Yeah. <laughs> Simple stuff, guys. It's 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 uh, it's so crazy. And I it's uh, it's such an an infectious way of thinking because and I, I, I'm about to release a, a YouTube ad where I kind of speak about this. And, and it starts off with like, you guys, the reason you're playing the way you do is because you've got daddy issues. And well, it, it really does shine the mirror at people. It's like, oh, if I can't win, it must be because I don't understand the strategy well enough. It's not that it's something wrong with me. Yeah, that's that's true. It, it like deflects the, uh, yeah, the responsibility. But the, 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 the point I'm making is like, we we a lot of people when they've not been held by their fathers in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a strong way when they haven't had that mature father figure they're kind of looking up to some kind of father figure whether it's like heavily relying on on the science or whether it's heavily relying on game theory optimal or whether it's like the the priests that come down and tell you what's good and what's bad people love to just bow down to authority because it makes them feel safe and held so when when they can look at these sims and say, oh well, the sim says I must do this, so I must do this. It, it's almost this like gentle lullaby in their ear that says, oh, of course I don't need to think for myself. I can just gently listen to the way that he splits his range, but I can also simplify there to keep it even more simple. And it's just like you get this daddy issues or through and through. And as soon as soon as you get past the point where you're wanting to just like fucking jerk yourself off to the soothing sounds of authority then poker becomes fun again and that's what poker is missing missing at the moment it's missing the fun well i feel like that's the only reason that my channel got any kind of popularity is because i was there like yeah this guy i don't know what i'm doing i'm just gonna do what i think i should do and if there's none of this there's none of this oh well the sim said this so i'm gonna do this it's like well i don't think he's bluffing so I'm gonna, you remember the hand the, the one where i followed the set of jacks on the turn yeah we, we had a podcast about yeah it's a long yeah, time ago. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I, I like turn a set of jacks and i raised the turn yeah it was like on a dry board yeah and i was like you well, your kings or something and i was like well he three bet pre from the big blind and no one really does that enough and then he checked the flop on a king high board no one really does that enough 
and then he three bet the turn when I raised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. That enough. Um, gonna let this one go, guys. And then was like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> what yeah. if he's got? Well, yeah, tell me. What if he's got what exactly? <laughs> <laughs> what if he's got all the hands he's meant to? He's meant to have according to the sim. Yeah. yeah then what? Was like, well, he yeah. doesn't. He's a human being. Oh, I lose X amount of big blinds because I made a minor mistake if he's playing perfect. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I've watched myself in the past years, and sometimes that kind of thought process would sink into my brain as well, where I'd be like, oh, "I've got the best hand I'm going to have here," and I'm like, "Shut up, John, fucking hell!" And I'll make some calls I mean, that I'm not meant to call, and it's like, yeah, I mean, that that that's definitely has to be there a little bit because there's definitely players that are tough, and you need that against the tough players. But the point is, if you're using it against every player, then you're not using your brain enough, like. When people are using RNGs to like make a river decision, it's like, well, you fucked up somewhere in this hand because there should have yeah. been some information that gave you enough yeah. information to make that river decision. You, if you you've got to the point where you're RNGing the river, you you've you played the hand wrong, or you're you have waving the white flag and attention. saying, I don't have enough information to make this yeah. decision for myself. Yeah, so you didn't you didn't pay attention. There's got to be some reason or some logic that you can use that isn't a random calculator spinning a number to make this decision. I was watching a I was watching a game theory um high stakes uh, cash game YouTuber I think it was Yuri but I could be wrong on this mm -hmm. and he, phenomenal poker player he's really really good he was on a river decision against I think a recreational player and he was like oh, it just feels like a fold it really feels like a fold but I I've got a strong hand so I'm actually going to randomize and give myself twenty five percent. Uh, the call and he rolls a 30 and goes oh thank god i'm so, I'm so lucky i was like what, what, what do you mean <laughs> it's 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 literally like when you're like oh am i am i gonna go do this tonight or am i gonna do this tonight and you flip a coin and it lands on this one and you're like oh damn it i wish it was this one and then you know that it was that one what that decision you, you should have made yeah, yeah of course uh um, i mean i'm, I'm not trying to go I, I completely agree with everything you're saying but I, i'm not trying to go all into that because there are definitely some times where i'm like all right, I really don't know. They could be bluffing. They might, I don't like it. It could be bluffing. So I don't mind then. If that's that's a reasonable reason. No, to pull it's, out not, the it's not. It's not a good no? time to randomize. If you if you think it could be bluffing, make the decision. It just means it's a harder decision. Okay, all right. Because okay. Unless, unless, unless you believe that we're in a universe where these two are like literally exactly the same EV. So he's rng <laughs> himself, which he probably hasn't. <laughs> yeah. like, and, and le unless unless a call and fold are exactly the same EV, you have to be able to intuitively just be like, okay, I think it's like this. I think we have to go with this one. And the yeah, closer yeah. it is, the harder it is to do this. But randomizing is like, well, sometimes you're going to choose this one and sometimes you're going to choose this one. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah. I, I take that back. I agree with you. Uh, it's funny though when we uh, I used to play Macau and we used to before Sims we used to use a lot of uh, card runners EV which is when you literally draw out the tree and eliminate hands from their range oh. so they and then you can look well it's it's great actually because then you can literally look at their range and like you can show someone else and be like no no I think you would still have these hands or I don't think you'd yeah, have those yeah, hands yeah, and, then, yeah, yeah. and then it will it will calculate the the EV for you so that was a pretty cool way of going oh that's interesting didn't know I was supposed to do this and that makes sense now and I can do this so that was a really good way for me to like. I think that it's very it's very powerful to, and I, I use Equilabs for the same thing it's very powerful to yeah. visualize somebody's range I, I'm not particularly visual in general I can I more feel it but for people yeah. that are visual if you can literally and I, I I make I make people do this or I ask people to do this sometimes like literally hit you know especially in MTTs where you know they peel cutoff versus MP and by the river they have like fucking three different hands they can have it's like you can you can put out the whole range pre here and you can take the flop decision and you get rid of these ones turn decision and by the rivers like yeah. these three hands and now you have such an easy decision I, I i call that range elimination so i'm just like use information to like reduce it reduce it reduce it until sometimes literally and i'm sure you've done this as well you can go you have this hand yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so and it's so just like when yeah. when you get so confident with that and so like like matter of fact with that you're just like okay i know he's got this hand and then your next part which everyone can do is well if he's got that what do i do what's the best play yeah, yeah, and it's like okay, well, he got that, and he's not going to fold it, so I give up. Or he's going to fold it, but I'm going to have to go all in. Or he's going to pay me, but he's not going to pay this much. Going to pay that much, and it, all of a sudden, you just play perfect, literally in in so many different spots. It's just like, well, you might as well be playing, playing with your cards face up because it's like there's no way you would ever have a different hand, especially against amateurs as well. They're just they're just almost telegraph what they have. And I was just going to say that when we used to play in Macau, it was funny because we would we would get the the, the Macau games they played relatively nitty in some of like the the mid stakes games. And you just figure out that on the river, if you went all in, uh, they'd fold a lot. And then you bet 70%, they'd pay you off a bit more. So I was like, well, does that mean that we go all in with bluffs and we go 70% with value? I was like, that can't be true. I'm going to put that into, <laughs> yeah, that, I'm going to put that into the sim and see if that's true. And then you put it through the sim and the sim just tells you to do that. You're like, ah, oh. turns out human intuition is just 
yeah. it's just actually great. Yeah, and if you just yeah, yeah it's just, oh, just go all in with your bluffs as long as obviously they don't figure that out. But it's it was just hilarious. Like oh, turns out turns out you were right again. Something something I love doing in live poker against recreational players, and I did this throughout my whole career, and I can say it now because I'm not playing too much. Is go all in as a bluff against them in a spot where it's like two x pot, and it's like you, they weren't expecting it for the size, and then start talking. And like nobody wants to be the guy that calls a two x pot shove with a fucking hero call hand when the guy's fucking talking, and it's like meant to be the most obvious thing in the world that he's he's fucking got it. And it, it, I, the amount of times I go all in. And then after like a split second, like, oh, thank God he hasn't called. He hasn't trapped me with quads or whatever the fucking nonsense. Game you had out. it pre-prepared in your head. So you got the split sec. So there's no gap. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, we, uh, it, and even online, just fucking spamming in the chat or emojis. If they, if they don't know it's me, it's very, it's very handy. I'm playing on GG at the moment under, under, you know, nobody knows my GG name and fucking, I forgot what it feels like where people fold. It's, it's oh, really? yeah it's nice now i go back on stars and everyone's fucking hero calling fucking 12x pot against me it's like it's yeah it's uh, great yeah well in macau you'd, you'd really enjoy this actually with that some of the high stakes games we got to the point where when we discuss hand histories we wouldn't just discuss the logic of the hand we would discuss maybe i could have said this and then i could have done this yeah, thing and yeah, that would have yeah, made yeah, the yeah. thing that i wanted to do so you got to the point where it was like we're not just talking about poker anymore we're talking about Oh yeah, but you kind of did that. You kind of did that weird. The way you put your bet in was really suspicious. So I think that was actually going to get you get called more. And I was like, okay, cool. So I'll do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just crazy the level you can get to with some of these things. I've been doing I've been doing live tower retreats recently, and it, yeah. it's it's like uh, it's like three and a half k to join. And there's there's been I've done two of them. There's been like eleven people that have, that have come both times. So we filled filled up, and the amount of intricacy that we get into when we're going through every single hand like there's the theory of it there's the exploit of it there's the how they perceive how the other the, the villain perceives it and then there's like how we can then adjust their range based on the 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 libraries that we're we get to, every yeah. single street like oh they called too fast so they probably would have had to think about it with x y and z yeah yeah, or they started looking nervous like three seconds after the turn card came out, which means that they they weren't as Something excited. Happened. They probably decided yeah. they were going to start bluffing, you know, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, I, I'm it, have to, I'll, I'll probably have to put my bo- my brother in for that course. He loves that stuff. Do it. Yeah. No, I, every every single person's come out and being like, "Whoa!" Oh. Like it's like even even Sam Clark, he came he came in like super unsure about himself about whether it's going to be good, and he he left being like, "You can't tell people it. this. This is too powerful. This will fuck up life poker if you tell people." All right, maybe I'll have to come to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty fucking good, man. It's pretty. It's uh, I, I, I really, I got to the, I got to the point where I was annihilating the high stakes. I was winning seven figures a year for like five years straight, and I, I never studied a sim. I never, never had a coach, and that, most of it was like obviously there's the exploitive side, but most of it was just life tells. And there, there were people like Stephen Chidwick, Ike Caxton, you know, fucking Sam Grafton that. Normally, when you sit down next to me, you're like, oh, okay, this is going to be tough. But with live tiles, you're like, okay, I can make 90% accurate reads on the river, 80% accurate reads on the river. I, I, I can get 20% more check races through on the flop. You know, I, I, can, I can get like 20% more three bets through pre-flop. And I, I was just annihilating people and people just thought I was running good, but it wasn't. I was just taking a ludicrously low variance approach. Like somebody opens cutoff, I'm folding big blind A7 offsuit. I'm just like, fuck this, I, I, because I know that I have such a big edge in all of these other spots and I don't have a read on this person because he's, he's doing whatever. It's hard to read. Fucking David Peters was hard to read just saying, like, fucking that guy, he's, he's a fucking machine. Um, but then if there are three other people on the table that are really easy to read, well, suddenly I, I just know I'm going to get more three bets through and I, I, I can I can just give up on the marginal spots. I don't need to run this big bluff. I don't need to I don't need to defend as wide. That, that was my whole career and uh nobody ever figured it out everyone just thought i was running good that's that's the same when i when i was in when i was in this private game just now the amount of people that told me how good i was running and i was just like well I, it's just a sign that you're you're doing something that's just like different to the rest of the field like i i, I use this phrase called radical assumptions where when i'm playing against someone that i'm trying to exploit i make very radical assumptions about how i think they play and then i just everything i do to that until I have a reason not to. Um, so like, you could get, you could, you could be in a like, so, Somebody's like a, somebody's like a station. And that's yeah, or some, some, someone will like, he will never call a 2x pot jam with a bad hand. Right, so right, I'm just right, like, right. all right, I'm just going to do this every single time until he get, until he decides that he's going to make a stand. I like there, there was, Yeah. And then uh, there was, I actually made a mistake with it. There was one guy that just like massively, massively just always bluffed. Just like 
you tell you what tell you what what people should not do to me and this is the biggest thing in my career that they they, they absolutely should not be doing is if a professional player talks a hand with me i can't help it i the biggest the worst thing you can give me is the information about how you think about a hand yeah and if you tell me any insight to how you think about a hand i can't i can't help it like i just i just i know how you think now so as soon as yeah. i know how you think i'm i i'm i'm gonna do a hand history at some point where i made i made the sickest bluff with um with a, with a straight a main hand that i should never have bluffed the do, you, the guys do, you say, do you want to say it now I, I can't remember the exact action, but okay. So I, I'm going to try it. I'm trying not to butcher it. But basically, I have King 10 under the gun. Uh, we have a VIP in like the big blind or something like that. So I'm doing a lot of limping because my strategy is basically, I believe that my EB was highest, spending as many parts with the VIP as possible. So in order to do that, limping just became a thing. How, how deep are we? Oh, good question. I don't, I don't remember exactly. Like a lot. Um, more, more than 100 bigs. Okay, okay. Yeah. So like, I guess that's deep for every 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 MTT player out there. Um, <laughs> But so the thing is, I was, I was, I wasn't necessarily balanced because you didn't need to be. Because if a reg ISOs you, if the VIP comes, you're just getting a sick price. So you just get to make all the EV from the fact that the VIP's in the hands. You don't have to worry about like being ISO too much. If you get ISOed and the VIP folds, you can just fold. Um, and I did have limp raises. Not that I needed them, but they were there. Um, so then people did start to limp behind too because they were like, okay, well, he's right. If the VIP folds and just change calls, then what's the point? Like the, the EV of this hand is zero, and I just want to play as many hands as possible when the VIP is here. So there's a couple of limps behind. I think we go four way to like, I think I have ten, no, I might, I might not have King 10, I might have 10 9, but either way, the, the flop is, uh, yeah, I have 10 9. The flop is Queen Jack X. Um, in general, in multi-way parts, my strategy is to just realize equity and not really worry too much about betting. Um, you're implied odds are so big. Huh? Your implied Sorry? odds are that guy is so big, you mean? Yeah, exactly. If I just make a hand and he doesn't see it, then it's just like, all right, I might get 40K, I might get yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 2K, whatever. Yeah. Uh, checks to the button, who's like an aggro reg. And he just, he, in, his, in his mind, he's just like, he's the kind of guy that like, oh, well, what else am I going to bluff? So I'm going to bluff. So even in spots where I'm like, well, man. this is stupid because like no one folds. Like the, if, yeah, if yeah, the guy doesn't yeah. fold, don't bluff. Oh, yeah. but what else am I going to bluff? Yeah. Nothing. You don't have yeah, to bluff. Exactly. Nothing. You guys That's aren't going to fall. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and so he bets, folds to me. I call, turns a jack. I tank the turn. Um, tank about leading, and he then what does he do? He does. He, I think he checks back. Rivers a king. Hmm. Um, I check. He. What the fuck happens in this hand? I need to get this action correct because I can't remember if he bets the turn or not. I think I think he bets turn and I tank call. And the river I make the straight and I check. So it was a king river. Um, so don't forget, I'm limped under the gun. So I can have kings, I can have queens, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can have some queen jacks. I have I have some king jacks as well. And he bets the river. Uh I I led the river. Oh, uh, you lead, he raises you three bet jammers and bluff. No, no. no okay. He bets, I check raise, he bets small, I check raise, he three bets the river, and I four bet jam for huge. Oh um, fuck! Because he's, because he, he's, he's just capped. capped at fucking King Jack. King Jack. Yeah. Queen Jack is his cap. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, no, he doesn't. He doesn't bet. He doesn't bet King Jack on the flop. So yeah, Queen Jack. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So and then uh, so yeah, so it was a four bet jam on the river in a limp pot. <laughs> like crazy. Oh, because I know this guy's a bluffer, but he's also a folder. You know what I mean? Like he's not the guy that's going to call with Queen Jack there because he he can work out hands. He can't seem to figure it out when when he's bluffing that he should not bluff, but he can figure. He's a folder though. He doesn't like to call off. So when I know that he's only got Queen Jack and he doesn't know, he like, this is one, like, I, like he, this is the time where he's not going to expect um, me to have a bluff here. Like, you, you know, you know, like that kind of meta is going on. He's not going to think that I'm just random punch jamming a straight here. Like, cause he, yeah. he's going to figure yeah, out. What, what, the, what the fuck are your like check raise four bet shove bluffs there that you don't have? It? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, and, and especially when I had a little bit of a tank on the turn as well. So I could like definitely like theoretically have a lot of King Jack here as well. Um, cause I, and that played into my head as well. I was like, well, I can have Queens. I can have King Jack. I can have Kings, um, and he can't, and he can only have Queen Jack. And what bluff do I have? <laughs> As he would always say, "What bluff do I have?" <laughs> oh, I'm bluffed straight. <laughs> yeah. And you you used to talk hands with him before or after the games? He, yeah, he would talk hands with me, and then he would just there was just an infinite amount of spots where he would just bluff, and I'm like, "Why'd you do that?" And he goes, "Oh, what else am I going to bluff?" And as soon as I heard that like five times, yeah. and I was like, "All right, okay, yeah, like, right, okay." He's just... turning out with bluffs in some spots. There, e even the people that think that they're bluffing in all spots, they 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 still have parts of the game tree where they have zero bluffs, and they think they have bluffs. They'll they'll get there with a value hand, but like, yeah, I play this like that, I play that bluff like, that. and there's no, you, you don't have a single fucking bluff anymore. Well, yeah, but this this guy was like probably does does have those bluffs, but wrongly, it was like. All right, the reason you don't have bluffs here is because nobody folds, so that's fine. Right. Yeah. But when you're in a spot where nobody folds, that's the reason you don't have bluffs here is because nobody folds. 
And if you're there, playing, there, the there, are, there are just some spots in poker that come up where the, the human element, like you, you'd have to, to find bluffs in a certain spot, you'd have to take a hand that's good 80% of the time that has ridiculously strong showdown value. And just because your range is ridiculously nutted by the river, you have to then turn these really strong hands into a bluff anyway. And people just yeah. don't find them. Yeah, yeah, and you would have had to play the turn fucking funky with a bunch of different hands as well. And the, the only way that you would ever know that you have to play a turn funky is if you're a solver and you know that the river might play out weird on these certain cards. And yeah, that, that, there, are, there are a bunch of spots that come up. It's like even the most GTO, GTO nerd in the fucking world would not have a bluff here. Yeah, are you, when you're there on the turn, you're like, oh, I've got to factor in 48 different rivers and make sure that I'm balancing every single yeah, one of them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I factored in 47, but this one, oh shit, <laughs> forgot about that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Forgot, it, forgot it, 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 it is it is crazy how bad people are at, at applying GTO. Like I I ask people who are like super hard hardcore into GTO, like how 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 does node locking work? Are you meant to node lock just the flop? Are you meant to node lock the turn in the river as well? And they just don't fucking know, but they do it all the time. You know they'll do it like oh i just know lock the flop and then it's like okay so does that mean that the rest of the game trees like sort themselves out to deliver yeah. or is it yeah, yeah. and i ask some questions they just don't fucking know yeah. and it, it's it, it is i mean you know it's my personal jihad to fucking offer at least some uh some alleviation to the to the brainwashing propagandists out there but, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's wild for new poker players to get into this and just realize that even the people that are teaching Sims, they don't, they don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, that, that, that's it's crazy. It's crazy. It's like, what is, your, what is the real measure then? If you're trying to find a coach now for people out there, other than obviously me and you were the best, but um, like what, what, what is the, because there's, there's people that are out there that play low stakes that are coaching that, yeah, they can probably help you get to a certain level. But like, I really think that it is like one of the best coaches I had who's a, who gets a bad rep in the poker industry. And I think rightly so is a guy called Crybaby, C-R-A-I Baby, and his name's Wei. And he was the best coach I ever had. And he wasn't the best coach because he was, he probably was good at poker. He, I think he had like an eight big blind 50K hand sample, which is nothing, uh, pure red line on fire and zoom. And he's the only guy that every time he coached me, I would not have a breakthrough in the session, but I'd have a breakthrough, like thinking about the things that he told me to think about. You know what I mean? Like the kind of like, Similar to what you said, you're trying to help your students think for yourself. And he really helped me with that. Really, really did. Like, so I owe him a ton of credit for what he's helped me with. But he then still puts the provided that he's a high stakes player and then hardly plays and doesn't really play and, yeah, and whatever else. I'm like, yeah, you, you, there's something like you are really good. I'm sorry. I, and I met this guy uh, who's a well known high stakes player called Top Cat in Vegas. And he plays in all the big games on GTA. Who the fuck are all these people? people. <laughs> I've never heard of huh? Who the fuck are all these people? I've never heard of any of these people. They're just <laughs> making their names on the side and live games. Yeah, 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 exactly. Right. That's the other thing I was going to say to you is that. Um, a lot of the guys in the high stakes games that I play, you know, when I, you know, me and you, we talk about like the hybrid, but we talk about like, yeah, you kind of like, you, you've you got to really understand the game and like GTO the way we, we think you should understand it, which is like, don't bluff the guy that doesn't fold, yeah, like yeah, yeah. You know, stuff like that. <laughs> Those players do exist. They're just way more quiet than we realize. Yeah. And they're making too and much they, money to want to say anything. Yeah, about it. exactly. Right. And they, and as soon as they realize that they're a bit like, Hey, hey Ginge, you might want to fucking shut up. Cause yeah, like, oh. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah. So they're like, yeah, we get it. We know everyone else in the middle is a fucking idiot. And like, but yeah, we're cool with them all being idiots. It's fine. Yeah, yeah I've, met, I've met a few of them as well. And I, for me, the poker journey has always been more of a community effort instead of, I don't like the whole, like, I'm going to make as much money as I possibly can and just maximize my own EV and then I'll leave everyone else to drown. Like, well, that's, me, that's a big like, thing. Well, I've, I've, that's that's sorry, the big quandary I have now because like talking about this private game, a lot of them like, hey, uh, the game's done the game's finished it may yeah. come back in the future but i'm not ever going to reveal where it was who was there all that kind of stuff and even then they're like i did a youtube video about it and they're like can you please take it down and i'm like i you know am i doing that for my dopamine am i doing that because i like the community and i want to help i don't know like it is a bit like i think it's, I, I'm, it's good to tell stories man it's good it's good to tell stories. i'm a storyteller like i said at the start that's my uh, that's my thing but you, ne you never know what you're gonna say in that story that's gonna strike somebody really hard and in five years time they'll come to you and be like oh that thing that you said about that private game it really changed my life yeah you know, like that's i realized that stories. yeah I, you know, like, if I, you know i like to think so a lot of all the people that you know call me about a poker and stuff i'm like well if he can make it then so can I. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, can. This fucking ginger guy from Birmingham can fucking make it. What the hell yeah. stopped me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not exactly there in this. 
in like the sober world, like grinding in all these fucking American tournaments and European. I, I just fucking did it at a beach in Thailand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 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 fu- it's fucking crazy how a lot of people they're amazing at poker, but they're they're pretty much destined to never make it, or at least never make it huge because they're they're just grinding fucking two hundred zoom, you know. And it's I I, I always tell my, I always tell my students make sure you can beat hundred zoom on stars then go do this play live then go do something else you know like take take that knowledge so you're not going to get annihilated by anybody and then you know supplement it as you go and maybe beat 200 eventually but once you have that you can beat 10 20 in vegas easily you know, easy easily yeah it's like not even well close. actually it's weird actually vegas these days 10 20 oh, okay, maybe, maybe not vegas maybe like florida or whatever yeah yeah for sure like uh the 510 is amazing but the 10 20 for some reason just doesn't run that much and then it just runs around five regs they're just like there's a weird there's a weird discrepancy between like the 1020, which is a 1020 with a 20 big blind ante that runs. And then sometimes we'll get a fish show up, but then there's a 100, 200 or 100, 100 or 100, 200 game that there's a big jump to the next game. So it's a really weird dynamic. And, and, and what tilts the life out of me in America is how political it is to game to games. I'm like, yeah. what is it about my country just politicizes everything? Yeah. Like, what, I don't understand. And, <laughs> and, and it's just like, it's infuriating because I'm just there like, I'll play anyone. I'll do whatever you want. I'll come and play it. Like it's Vegas, the gambling capital of the world. How can you not run a public hundred hundred game? They're like, no, Ginge, if we didn't have this public hundred hundred game, private game, the game wouldn't run. And I'm like, there's a there's a 30 people here during the World Series. You think the game wouldn't run? Are you kidding me? Like this is like and but I they I got in trouble again for speaking out on social media and then they let, they let me in the game so I shut up so they bribed me basically. Um, <laughs> they bought uh, your silence. That's funny. They bought my silence, but they didn't buy it very. They didn't. They, yeah, I, that was the only game I seemed to be able to win in in Vegas as well. Um, but like, yeah, it was. Just, it's just I, there's some part of me that doesn't like it. Like I, I have I, a bit I, of an I advantage now. I never got involved in the politics. I got invited to quite a few private games just because people liked me, but I never got involved in the. Well, that's the thing. That's what I'm about to say. Like, I get a few more invites now because of because of that. But the amount of scams I've seen, the amount of like, so it is good having one in the casino. Um, but it's very that the way it works now is you bring if you bring a whale, you get a seat, and you might get credit for having that. And it's just like that seems so predatory, but it's it makes like sense. what else? It makes sense. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, you know, around and just round regs and shit like that. But that's that was my problem. I was like, I'll play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the way it works in Macau is like, um, when well, Macau's back open now, uh, is you go and sit down, and whoever plays plays, and they, they keep two seats open in case the VIP shows up, which is a, the best way to do it in my opinion. And if you're at the table and the VIP sits down, you're at the table. If you leave, I think that's so, down, so much seat. better. So much better. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. I, fuck, I fucking hate when the VIP leaves and everyone else just stands up and stops playing. It's like, how, they, they how, have, how fucking obvious can I make that? Yeah. They have another system for that as well. It basically is uh, you only one person can leave when that, at a time. And so, for example, let's say that there's seven seats for regs and there's a list of 10 players. Uh, one person can leave. We then have to give the next person on the list 10 minutes to respond to getting the seat or not if they don't respond um then we'll go down to the next person but then another red can't leave until someone else has shown up so it could take sometimes up to an hour to, to clear good. the table it's probably good yeah, which is which is again a, a, a just avoids that predatory style thing and then some people won't play anyway but yeah it's uh it means you're like, like i've got that I'm system down past and you're still fucking like fuck, uh, come on man <laughs> yeah, sure, sure, emergency, emergencies obviously happen but, uh, <laughs> but yeah but cow has a system down pat it's it's the best it's it's annoying because if you want to play in a good game sometimes you have to play like a 40-hour session because you just got to be there well, like you, you know this sounds intense dude i've never been but it sounds fucking intense it's not the greatest place to live in the world, to be honest. It's like you can't, you can't, you can only eat casino food or McDonald's. There's not really much. Other I wouldn't options. be able to live. I can't. Yeah, I exactly. Yeah, and obviously, I, I still work with Rome, by the way. Oh, how's it going? Yeah, right. great. For people listening is a nutritionist that we have mutual friends of. It's funny because I actually reached out to him because of the podcast you did with him. I'm probably going to do. A po- I'm actually going to go meet him uh, in April. The first time I'm ever actually going to meet him in person. I don't know if you've met him in person. Yeah, yeah, he came around my house once. Really awesome. Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, so it's my mom's 50th and my grandma's 80th. I can't miss it. Uh, and they're going to Spain to celebrate, and he lives about an hour and a half away. So I'm going to go. Yeah, that's amazing. To, to, to go back to the question that you asked earlier, what I do want to say is like, how, how can a new player determine whether a good coach is a good coach? And for me, the biggest point is okay, they have to have good results, obviously. But other than that, they have to be humble. 
and you'll see it so many times. Like I'll see people doing uh, reviews of my footage or, or the, you know, reviews of someone else's footage or, and it will just be like, this is definitely bad. And I know why. And it's like, if you're saying like, this is bad, this is bad, this is good, this is bad. And you see yourself as this kind of central authority of what's good and what's bad. You don't understand poker because yeah. You know, to use a two third size on the turn or use a two X pot size on the turn or to bet a third on the flop or a better quarter on the flop. How that person is going to react is so unique to that person in every single different spot. How the, every every spot is different. So that that's already a completely, completely unique situation. How your hand then interacts with that spot is a completely different situation. The game dynamics or whatever the fuck it's going to be your own table image. There's so many variables that go into it that the human brain cannot process what is optimal you can say okay this is definitely bad you know if somebody fucking 12x pot sh shoves a turn bottom pair or whatever but then yep. when it comes to like okay when when i'm looking at a person's footage i'll be like as long as your thought process is fine your assumptions don't need to be correct that like your assumptions they'll get better over time yep. as long as the thought process is clear logical and concise then we're fine and yep. i don't know what the best size is my intuition says it's this you know, my intuition is going to be more right than other people's on average, but it's, it's not, it's not the final say. And yeah. so for me, when I'm looking for a coach, I'm looking for somebody that understands poker on a deep level conceptually can articulate that in a really, in a really refined way and doesn't have this fucking egotistical chip on their shoulder that thinks that they are the, they're the last say about what's good and what's bad. Yeah. I, I, I would just add to that. And I think that links all your points together. It's just someone that's very understanding. It's just that someone that's like, also not judgment like you feel like you can just let out all the bad logic thoughts that you have and they're not going to judge you and say oh that's yeah, terrible why that. did you think that it's like you need to be in a space where it's like look i just didn't know what to do here and you and you're comfortable saying that to them and they're and they're and they don't make you feel any you know badness towards that like the, the best lessons i ever had are just when i went I, I i don't know what to do like i literally have no idea even where to start thinking about this yeah. uh, and some some of the worst students i had were the ones that just, I went, why did you do that? And they go, oh, I just fancy having a bluff. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't care. I don't, I don't, I don't care. Like if you had some logic here, I could help. Like, I don't, I don't mind. But if you're just fancying having a bluff every now and again, cause you're a bluff for a while. I, I don't know how to, uh, I don't know how to fix that one. I remember watching, uh, when I first got into the high rollers, I remember watching Steve O'Dwyer just completely punt off a hand in a tournament. And afterwards I was like, what, what, why did you do that? I was just out of interest. I, I, you know, I'm not judging. I know you're great at poker. Why, why did you do that? And he was like, I just felt like winning the hand. I was like, fair enough. Sometimes, sometimes you just feel like trying to win the hand and logic yeah. goes out the window. But I, I assume that he was humble enough to then look back at that and be like, probably should have done something else. Yeah. And like, it's, it's important to not have that judgment as well as a coach because these guys are new. These guys are learning. And it might just be like one nugget that you fix for the way they think about the game. And that could just set them on a whole new path you know what i mean like their, their trajectory is like break even and all of a sudden you give them one little bit and a boom like i have that you know, i i get i get not not to kind of toot my own horn too loudly but I, I get a lot of messages of people saying like hey i was studying on fucking upswing for fucking five months and then i took your i took your master class and here's my graph it's fucking like this and then it's perform. yeah and it's have literally you, just you... just getting rid of the shit out of their thought process well there's a video i released on youtube which was basically the first draft of my academy course and if you ever have a chance to have a look at the comments on that video, it's like, this is the best free content of poker I've ever seen on the internet. Yeah, How yeah, is yeah. this available for free? And this is like the, the best poker video I've ever seen. I'm like, and I've had people in high stakes come over to me and say, that was one of the best videos of poker. I've ever. It's just, it's an hour and a half video, but it's the, I tell you what that frustrates me about poker courses, which I didn't want to do in this, is the amount of fluff they put in. Yeah, and I, yeah, this was just yeah. like a no bullshit. This is how you actually fucking play poker. This is how you, this is how you make money. Yeah, there's supplementary stuff if you need it, but like to go specifically into like, oh, this is check raising and this is this and this is that. But like realistically, it's like, don't fucking bluff up a guy that doesn't fold. This is what GTO actually means. This is how you actually play. And good luck. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll definitely check it out. I, I've, I've had the same. Sometimes I've done, I, I did like a mini masterclass thing that was like an hour and a half and I came out and I was like, it's for free and it's out there, but it, it's probably the best content I've ever fucking made in my life. Yeah. And so sometimes, sometimes you just get in the flow state when you're teaching and it's like, oh, I can just say like the most concise and precise things that, about poker that I know. And I can say it in a really short amount of time. Because and, you actually understand it. That's a sign of a sign of someone that actually understands something is the, the ability to explain it simply. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Yeah. Anyone that's I, using all these big turns and terminologies and all this other like fluffy stuff around it, it's like, 
what are you actually trying to say, mate? Like, is this a fault or not? Like, the reason it's a fault is because of X, not, well, he could do this and that. Is this his range? And he kind of did that. And maybe I should call him. I can hear people coming in my house and they're about to go upstairs and move move a, move a mattress. So let, let's finish off. Maybe we do a part two of this in a fucking couple sure. of weeks. Well, if, if people uh, release this on your channel, if people want to see my channel, it's Ginge Poker. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll release you, part two on yours or something like that, yeah. Yeah, sure. If anyone's got any questions about this, obviously fire them away and I'll, I'll jump in the comments as well. Yeah, maybe maybe to finish, where, where are you now thinking about where you want to take your life? That's a good question. I'm on a bit of an exploratory phase right now. Um, I'm going to be traveling around a little bit to do some vlogs and I've got my mom's birthday, like I said. So I'm going to be Cambodia, Vietnam, Spain. What, what, what about inner work? Inner work's a good one. I don't know. I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do day to day that isn't poker. I feel like there's still something I need to meditate and think about. I'm in a, I'm in like a, a place where I'm taking advice from the right people, such as yourself. And I'm in a position where thinking about it is, I'm, I'm, you know, I've got the right people beside me to come to a good decision about it. And I'm, I'm happy taking my time about it because like, I still, you know, I feel like I climbed to the top of this mountain and I'm, I'm enjoying the view now, if that that's makes sense. Sick. That's sick. That's such a beautiful yeah. fucking imagery, man. You, and you did it over fucking 10 years or however long you were playing poker. That's, yeah. that's yeah. fucking, that's well done, dude. So, yeah, it might not be done yet, but thanks a lot. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. All right. Cool. Good talking to you, man. I'm going to head. You too. Peace.